Okay, we're going to deal with the hormones of the uh, menstrual cycle, which you have done at high school. I know this, it's on the GCSE bite-sized thing. Um, so, let's see if we can make it a bit m more understandable, perhaps. So, in the eugenesis, or the metagenesis video, uh, we know what happens during, in the ovary, during the menstrual cycle. So we're starting off with our primordial follicles and they're surrounded by these theci cells and we know that over the first bit of the cycle they're going to get the oocyte is going to complete meiosis 1 It's going to do meiosis 2 and stop at metaphase. And then it's going to stay. It gets released to ovulation. So this bit here, day 14, around ovulation. And then it's going to head off and be fertilized or not. So it's, it's now in the fallopian tube. So that's what's happening with the oocyte. What's happening with the cells around the oocyte? So these cells here are the granulosa cells. Is that these are going to proliferate. That just means they're going to make a lot of cells very quickly. I love that word. I can't spell it, but I love it. So they're going to proliferate and eventually become a, a graphene follicle. And at ovulation, that's going to burst open. And what happens to the cells is that they're going to form the corpus luteum. So that's what we did, that was that, that sort of quite complex looking um, diagram of the ovary, wasn't it, when we did eugenesis. So, and the thing that sort of everybody knows is that that whole thing is caused by FSH. So what starts off the development of the uh, follicle is FSH. Uh, just before we move on to FSH, couple of words that you'll see sort of floating around um, is follicular phase that means the follicles developing and luteal phase which is when the corpus luteum forms now this Luteal phase is a fairly fixed 14 days, it doesn't seem to vary very much, but the follicular phase does. Who knows why? There's loads and loads of information out there because of course it's absolutely critical for understanding fertility. So we're going to look at uh, FSH because that's the hormone that you're all dead familiar with because it does what it says on the tin, it starts a follicle to develop. So I did a little sort of graph here. Oh, it's a bit of a wobbly line. We can put on, these are what we call our anterior pituitary hormones. So these are hormones that are released up in the brain and go into general circulation like hormones do. <coughs> and FSH, so these are uh, hormones, I'm going to look at two eventually, but these are the hormones that are acting on the ovary. So our first one is FSH, does what it says on the tin, starts a follicle to develop, follicle stimulating hormone. And it's released right at the beginning of the menstrual cycle to start that follicle developing 
start the proliferation of the cells, start the oocyte off on its meiosis 1 journey. It then dips down all the way to ovulation, we'll do the reason for this. Ovulation, we get a sudden little spike and then it's at fairly low levels again. Oh, that's a slightly straighter line than my axis. Anyway, our other uh, anterior pituitary hormone, so I'm a sort of bluey green one, oh, it's FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. And FSH is a standard abbreviation, so unless you're asked to name it, you can stick to FSH. And our other one is LH. Now LH uh, seems to be necessary to release uh, for the granulosa cells to actually be able to produce hormones. Same hormone operates in males. Uh, they call it interstitial cell stimulating hormone in males. Which is quite interesting. Why do they just call it LH? I don't know. It's exactly the same thing um, and it seems to be needed in order for the Leydig cells to produce uh, testosterone. So I'm just going to draw it slightly above this line because so we've got to have some level of it. And again this is one that spikes at ovulation. So the sort of cause of ovulation is the spike in these two hormones and we do need to know why that spike happens. So we'll move on now to the ovarian hormones because the ovarian hormones, and I'm going to do these in purple so they match up here, are the ones produced by the ovary, oddly enough. So, so I'm going to do a slightly bigger axis here. Now your ovarian hormones effectively control what's going on in the endometrium. So the ovarian hormones are made by these granulosa cells and at the beginning, in the follicular phase, the one that's produced is going to be oestrogen. So effectively the more granulosa cells you have, the more oestrogen you're going to produce. So the granulosa cells start to proliferate under the influence of FSH. So we've got a direct link from FSH oh, to the proliferation of those cells and then those cells are proliferating and they're releasing oestrogen. So oestrogen levels start out low, they're going to rise all the way till just before ovulation and then inexplicably they're going to dip. And I'm saying inexplicably because I have looked this up um, on all sorts of medical sites, fertility sites, uh, everywhere. Can't find out why. So nobody knows. So this is our oestrogen produced by granulosa cells. Now you'll notice that as the as these, this oestrogen level is going up, the FSH level is going down. So here we've got a bit of negative feedback going on. So remember that your oestrogen hormones are not kind of just knocking around near your gonads, um, just affecting the uh, endometrial lining, they're right round there in the circulation. So you could take a blood sample out of your arm and detect the level of oestrogen in it, uh, or the level of FSH, or the level of LH. They're, they're out there circulating round, going through your heart, going through your aorta, going down your arms and your legs and to all your other organs. It's just that they're only targeting, they're only linking to receptors at particular sites. So oestrogen is circulating round and it's going through the pituitary gland and it's switching off negative feedback, switching off the FSH. And that's really important because you don't want to have continual, you know, sort of day, day zero, start one oocyte developing, day five, start another one, day ten, start another one. 
that would be absolutely counterproductive to this event here, ovulation, let's get it fertilised, let's make a pregnancy. You'll notice that where the oestrogen level peaks, that seems to be linked to the peak of LH and FSH and actually this now is an example of positive feedback. So initially in the follicular phase the oestrogen is circulating around the bloodstream and it's inhibiting the release of FSH and then just before ovulation where you've got these really high levels of oestrogen when the anterior pituitary is detecting that it's then releasing a big surge of LH and FSH so that's positive feedback it's sort of increasing the effect. After the ovulation takes place and we've got the formation of the corpus luteum, the corpus luteum is also an endocrine uh, gland and it's going to secrete oestrogen until it, uh, I don't know whether the say realises, until it's not getting a, a stimulus from HCG. I think is the better way of putting it. It's not a thinking machine, it's not going to realise anything. But if there's no pregnancy, you don't get any uh, HCG released. Without HCG, the corpus luteum just degenerates and it stops churning out hormone. Our other hormone that's released by the ovary is progesterone. And progesterone is not released at all during the follicular phase, it's a purely corpus luteum thing, so these graphene, these granulosa cells left behind uh, start to churn out progesterone. So that's going to be at pretty low levels, and then it's going to follow the same pattern as oestrogen. So rising, once there's no HCG to keep it going, it's then going to dip. So that one's progesterone. Now in the luteal phase, both of these hormones, so progesterone and oestrogen, oh, wrong colour, progesterone and oestrogen are both going to cause uh, negative feedback and suppress the follicle stimulating hormone. So this is going to be negative feedback here. Obviously both hormones uh, do have a role in pregnancy as well, so again, you know, they're, or they're going to keep the LH and uh, FSH levels low. And in addition, progesterone is going to inhibit the action of oxytocin, which is the hormone that causes contractions. So it actually prevents the uterus contracting and expelling a not quite ready fetus. So, uh, oh, I'll be traditional. Let's use red. So, the effect of these hormones tends to be on the uterus, and I'm just going to draw this as a graph and not sort of, you know, be too graphic about it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> day zero is always the first day of menstruation. So this is when the endometrial lining, so we're talking here, this is the depth of the endometrium. So this is where the endometrium is shed, uh, it's what we call a period, a menstruation if you're going to be posh, and therefore the endometrium depth is going to get less and less and less. The, east, the, the action of oestrogen on the endometrium is to build it, so again you've got a proliferation thing going on, and the depth of the endometrium is going to rise, it's going to kind of level out. And then, as soon as those progesterone levels are dropping, that's the signal for it to be shed. So progesterone and oestrogen are maintaining, this actually, this, the luteal phase, 
in the endometrium it's often called the secretory phase because the uh, um, the inside gets more sort of mucusy. It's quite that's quite an unpleasant thought. I don't want to think about that. So maintenance uh, and oestrogen is causing it to build in the first part of the cycle, and this is menses. So hopefully that makes a bit more sense. So you see these very, they look very complicated, the graphs, and you, you've got sort of various ways of dealing with it. You can either do it sort of, this is what's happening in day 0 to 5, this is what's happening day 5 to 14, this is what's happening day 14 to 28, this is what's happening actually at day 14, and I think that's quite a good way of dealing with it. <coughs> the other thing you could do is uh, do it as a sort of a table, so you can either do it a timeline way, or you can do it graph by graph. And perhaps, actually, if you're going to learn it, doing it all three of those ways would really help. Um, the next video I'm going to do is going to be on ne this negative feedback system. Okay.